Um, <clears throat> hi. Hello. I'm so excited today to welcome Lana. I think you pronounced it on your last episode, Prebich. Um, yeah. That, well, if we're going like the right way, like that aligns with my cultural heritage, but Prebich. Perfect. Okay. But your cultural heritage is yeah. Bosnian, right? Yeah. So if you're saying it in Bosnian, it's Prebich. Amazing. Uh, so interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until I listened to this last episode. Anyway, so Lana is the host of Modern Psychedelics, which is one of my favorite podcasts and has sort of taken, I think, the podcast world by storm in the psychedelic world. And uh, she interviews incredible change makers in the space, um, has sort of supplied me with so much knowledge into this world that I have spent time in, but haven't really spent like scientific time in. So uh, if you're interested in psychedelics, which many of you are, I highly recommend modern psychedelics. So we are going to jump in with Lana. Welcome. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. It's always nice to hear people's thoughts on the podcast. Um, and we were just speaking to the fact that this is called everything you need is inside. And that is the phrase that was on my box and flow studios before I shut down in New York city. And it was sort of this double entendre of at the time it was before I did any psychedelic assisted therapy, but just this sort of adage that like we have our tools and our answers inside and you would get the best boxing yoga balanced workout, mind, body, soul, when you took the class. So that's the name. I love it. It's so true. It's definitely a principle that I'm living by, you know, it's all inside. Totally. Um, well, with that said, tell us about you and how you got into this work. Sure. Hmm. How far do I go back? I will start. Grad school seems like an okay place to start, which isn't too long ago. Um, Cause I don't want to give you guys the whole story, but yeah, in grad school, I just kind of was in this place of being totally shattered. I had like a friendship that was really important to me. And I was in love with someone who didn't love me back. And then we like entered this really complicated relationship. So there was like love life stuff going on. I was doing a master's in economics, which I totally hated, but was just forcing myself to go through. And it was just like, okay, yeah, I think now is a good time to start therapy. And that's kind of like, that was like my first attempt to start putting myself together and I don't know, quote unquote, fixing myself. And I was also, yeah, partying a lot at the time and like exploring things like MDMA and all of that fun stuff and mushrooms and LSD. And I was kind of using psychedelics very recreationally at first and then had a couple of very spiritual, meaningful experiences with psychedelics and realized like, wow, this is so much more powerful than therapy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, or this makes therapy so much more powerful too, because there was times when I was doing both and then, yeah, I kind of went through a really hard breakup, I had no choice, or I felt like I had no choice, but to start drinking ayahuasca, it had been on my radar for many years. And then, yeah, it all kind of unfolded from there. And that's where it really began. And I just did like three long years of medicine work with Aya. And then somewhere in the middle there, I started modern psychedelics because I was just learning so much about psychedelics and got really, really obsessed with it to the point where I felt that I wanted to just share it with people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'll stop there. That's kind of how it all started. So with that said, when you say, because I, I know that because psychedelics are becoming such a buzzword, I know it's like, well, how do you get into it or where do you find it, whatever. And I'm just curious when you started sitting with ayahuasca and I know that I, I remember hearing you've sat with her at what, how many times, like 20 plus or 30 plus? 32 now. And I, I only know this because I keep track in my journal. I'm not like one of those, like, you know, need to keep track of it. I just kind of like write down my ceremony numbers, but I yeah. mean, 32 times. <laughs> You were getting a, a major in, uh, I mean, a master's in economics. So I wouldn't be surprised if you were <laughs> keeping all the data. But anyways, I mean, that's incredible. What is that? I've only sat with ayahuasca twice and that in itself was so intense and I'm sure I'll have more experiences, but like, did the medicine find you? Was it in a group setting? Was it always the same setting? What did that look like? Yeah, well, I, like I said, I knew about ayahuasca for 
quite a few years before I actually felt ready to have the experience. But right as I was learning about it, there was something in me that was just like, this is like, this is for me. Like, this is going to happen one day. I'm not ready yet because, oh my God, vomiting scares the shit out of me. Like I had only puked twice in my life before then. And now I'm just like, you know, (laughs) not afraid at all about it um, in ceremony, but I was just really afraid. And then um, I, yeah, I discovered that there was a place close to my hometown like an hour and a half away and I was like oh that's interesting so I don't have to go to the Amazon cool um and that was just on the radar for a while and then going through this breakup had done like a lot of therapy was going to like go to meetings and then just hit a wall Mm -hmm. where it just I just knew that it was like a lost cause to just continue down this path because I was going to these depths in myself that like the therapy wasn't supportive of and I just knew I needed a modality that would like take me deeper and help me understand these experiences so yeah eventually I came to a place of like okay I'm ready now is the time and that decision very much felt like yeah there is no other option Mm -hmm. like I said it took me years to get to that place um and then yeah before I go on and is that good and then I think like the group setting and stuff Yeah. So I'm curious though, you mentioned other psychedelics that you were doing them recreationally. Were you ever doing any of them therapeutically before you got to Aya or you jumped into Aya? (laughs) Yeah. Great question. I had done, um, a sit with mushrooms therapeutically and looking back on that, it was really cute because (laughs) the insights that I got in that session were like, they were so like, they were not that like substantial or deep but they played a huge role in my in my journey like I had insights around like oh like the people who hurt me in my life like they weren't doing it on purpose (laughs) and I just like really needed the mushrooms to show me that um and that kind of that kind of um that was the first that was the first like therapeutic experience with it I did have a recreational experience with LSD that uh was very much like an inner journey helping me see why I should quit smoking and I quit smoking cigarettes from that um but yeah I think I only had like a couple therapeutic type of experiences before diving into ayahuasca which I haven't really thought about before so interesting because you know I've heard such mixed you know there's knowledge information all over the place and my experience with psychedelics was like purely it wasn't on a whim. It was the same. I was like going through a strange breakup. There was something in me that was stuck. COVID had closed my business that I'd put my whole life into. And the man that I was dating was on the board of maps. And so he had been going through MDMA assisted therapy for growing up in a wartime country, et cetera. And um, actually he said to me the first time we were intimate, did something happen to you? And I was like, what? And that's what led me down the like, first I got defensive, like, what do you mean? I wasn't ready. Like you, you know, and then I was like, holy shit, did something happen to me? So that was what sparked my, my curiosity, but that led me to getting a colonic, being on the colonic table. And my lady being like, I smoke Bufo all the time, like talking about the toad. And then, I mean, three days later, I was in Janice Joplin's old apartment, smoking five amino DMT. And I never done a drug before. Oh my God. Yeah. So Yeah. So it was like crazy, crazy. but so I mentioned that because like, it wasn't like I was guided or told like, this is what you do first. And now I'm hearing from people who I speak to, like that it's recommended that I is like the first thing that you do. And I would so say that that's not what I would recommend. People say that Aya is the first thing to do. That's yeah. I mean, I've been hearing that. And to me, that's so confusing because even it wasn't the first thing I did and it certainly would be never, ever be the first thing I would recommend. Yeah, definitely not. I I mean, I think with like what to start with, it's such a personal journey and it really takes like just listening to yourself and knowing like when you're coming from the ego versus like, is this an experience that I'm actually being called to have? But Yeah, I think, I mean, going right to boo, I've never even smoked boobo and I'm Uh, not at all called to that medicine, but I mean, it's so ungrounding. (laughs) I think that's the point, just as you said, like purely like trust this, it was honestly 
it was the only thing I think that would have worked for me to blow through the layers of ego that I was carrying because of all of the trauma that I was holding. Like mm -hmm. I needed to blow through completely to yeah. almost disintegrate and then be like, holy shit, I don't understand. And then start tiptoeing into what that looks like, like held one-on-one -on -one for two years. Um, wow. So, and which is why I mentioned to you, like, oh, did you start anything before you jumped into Aya? Because on your most recent podcast, because I want to go into the Uboga experience, because I also think, as you say, it's a medicine that people aren't familiar with. So I would love for you to, to jump into that. But you mentioned that Aya, it it was confusing for you or it was, you know, or I want you to speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're, you're probably referring to like a quote that I've posted on the Instagram and that was from the podcast. Yeah, basically when I was in my Iboga journey, which we'll touch on, and, and by the way, I'm in this place with Iboga where I'm like so in love with it that when I saw like your face, the, when, <laughs> you did. Okay. When people like say the word Iboga, like my body just like tingle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so connected to that medicine. And I used to have that with ayahuasca. Like mm -hmm. anytime someone would just say the word, I would just like get this feeling and that's gone now. And it's mm -hmm. Iboga that lights me up, which is kind of cool. But um, I had this experience in the Iboga medicine, which lasts 24 to 30 hours, like the really like peak experience of it. And um, yeah, I was kind of getting these insights around like, this is what I've been looking for. It was showing me like truth, like the voice of truth was presenting itself. And it was like really saying that like, this is, these are kind of like, this is it. This is what I've been looking for, like through all of my like quote unquote seeking and medicine work. Um, and just kind of telling me that I, I kind of had to walk down that ayahuasca path to get here. Cause there's no way in hell I would have jumped to Iboga. <laughs> no way. And yeah, I think ayahuasca was kind of necessary and like really did heal my heart in such a profound way. Cause ayahuasca is such heart medicine. Um, but yeah, Iboga kind of told me like ayahuasca, I got lost in ayahuasca and it confused me. Whereas Iboga showed me the clear and direct path. And I don't think that like the getting lost and the confusion is necessarily like a bad thing. It was a part of the journey and ayahuasca is more like universal energy and ethereal energy and about universal love. Whereas Iboga is very grounded and earthy and like about your personal truths um but I could just see I didn't even know ayahuasca confused me until I saw how clear and direct iboga was like I had to see the contrast of the two in order to see that like wow yeah with ayahuasca it was like maybe I should go down this path and maybe I should go down that path and maybe I should consider this and maybe I should do that. And like, maybe this is the reason that I'm like this, or maybe that's the reason, like, it's kind of this like world of opportunities that opens up. Whereas Iboga was just like, very like, this is the path. <laughs> do you think that that's potentially also a reflection of where you are now versus where you were? It's like what I'm sort of hearing too is like, just in viewing from an outside perspective, just even how you've, you know, created your business and grown and whatever else. And the way that you're speaking now, who you're speaking to, how you're speaking to yourself, it seems that potentially that's a reflection of the, the more grounded, like that you've become more grounded too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you listen to the latest episodes of modern psychedelics, but I basically said like, yeah, the podcast is going to be a lot more grounded, a lot less fluffy. Like, I don't even believe half of the new age stuff that I used to believe six months ago. Mm -hmm. Like, I really feel like I've just really come down to earth. Whereas before I was like, so focused on like, ascending and like the 5D experience and like, leaving earth and all of that stuff. And Iboga just really just grounded me and showed me that like, earth is fucking awesome like earth is where it's at <laughs> I remember you saying that and I remember seeing you even like posting from what looked like a really beautiful environment I, what, it was in Costa Rica oh my gosh so beautiful yeah it was um in the mountains uh the main town is called Perez Zeladon and it is just the most beautiful land that I think I've ever been on like jungle mountains and there's a river and oh so stunning 
So for those of you who are listening who are interested in medicine work but haven't necessarily dabbled, what Lana and I are speaking to, I think, is just this this medicine, these medicines. I can't speak to iboga, but my experience with psilocybin, less so MDMA because I, you know, it's it's not a natural substance, but um, psilocybin ayahuasca, it really brings you in connection with like truth, I think, in surroundings, environment universal energy. Um, I think all of it is meant to sort of bring you back to your true self. Um, so in that, like when you go and do ayahuasca 32 times, like how does that, what is the shift from the first or the beginning? What does that journey look like just with that medicine? And to be clear, can you just explain what ayahuasca is high level? Yeah, for sure. So ayahuasca is an Amazonian ancient sacred plant medicine that's used across many, many different tribes within South America and Central America. And it is a brew that is made from the ayahuasca vine and the charcuna leaves. And those are put, uh, the charcuna leaves contain the psychoactive substance DMT. However, ayahuasca is different from DMT. It has DMT in it, but it's not like the blast off experience that you would have when you smoke DMT. It lasts about six to eight hours and it can be you know received either shamanically or through the santo daime uh church setting which they have kind of different like rituals and uh ways that those ceremonies are run i've only really experienced the shamanic mm -hmm. experiences so i can't really speak to the churches but um yeah and it's a beautiful medicine that can attune you to love and bring you back into your heart. It's very purgatory. It's very common to purge. So most commonly to vomit. Um, people can also, you know, uh, get diarrhea or um, um, <laughs> purge from that direction, I suppose, uh, to put it nicely. Um, or you can also just like shake. And it, it, the purging is amazing because it releases emotions and energy that have been stuck in your body for years and you know some shamans even say that as you purge you're purging like different lifetimes now whether or not that's true we don't really know um we can't really prove if there are other lifetimes or not and that's something personal but um yeah it's just an incredible cleansing medicine mm -hmm. um yeah does that does that help I forget yeah, I the love the was. description. And then I wanted, I was curious the progression from, you know, Aya 1 to Aya 32, what brought you back so many times, like over the course, I'm just, just how does that look? Yeah. So I think it's important to know that. So in the psychedelic space, a lot of people talk about having X amount of time between journeys. Um, so that's kind of the Western take on it. However, if we look at the way that ayahuasca is consumed in the jungle, in the Amazon, um, in the lineage from where it comes from, uh, these people are actually consuming ayahuasca like twice a month, monthly. It's something that they ritually use and use often. So there is this kind of like tribal ritualistic aspect to ayahuasca. And for me, like it does sound really intense for people out there. I'm sure there's people listening that are like, oh my God, 32 ceremonies in three years. That's insane. Um, it's not. <laughs> I really felt this continued pull to keep sitting with it during this time in my life where I was on what I call the speed train to healing. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, I mean, in those three years, I feel like I got to examine and heal like 31 years of my whole entire life. And it's like, every time you sit with the medicine, something different presents or like you meet a different part of yourself or you're constantly like purging something that you might not have even seen before. And for me, my biggest intention with ayahuasca is to heal my heart and to come to a place of completeness and fullness within myself. And it took me three years to get there. And I think something that isn't talked about is that ayahuasca is like, it's a relationship that you build with this medicine and it can be a long game. Mm -hmm. 
Some people only need a couple of sits with it to get what they want. Some people need three years of medicine work. Some people, you know, I, there's people in my tribe who like come very often and that it is a part of their spirituality and their lifestyle. So I guess like, who was I ceremony one and ceremony 32? I mean, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I feel like I was this lost broken child mm -hmm. and now I'm like I didn't know how to live life at ceremony one like I was like having suicidal ideation present I didn't know how to go on I didn't know how to not feel anxiety I didn't know how to not feel depression I felt so uncomfortable in my own skin I like hated so much of myself and Fast forward three years, and this was exactly my third year anniversary that I finally got the healing that I was looking for, which was a complete healing of my heart. And I felt this openness in my heart and could really just see that, like, wow, it, it's healed. I got what I was looking for. Like, that yeah. was just like someone who had done so much work and who wasn't afraid to go to any depths within herself and who wasn't afraid to face herself and who had moved into um, seeing the world in a completely different way from a place of non-judgment and acceptance. I mean, oh my God, I'm so done. Wow. <laughs> just reflecting on that. Now it's just like, you know, it really, like I said, attunes you to this like universal energy where like you see that everything has its place and you like really see the darkness for what it is and you see the light for what it is and see that like there's just room for all of it in this dualistic earth experience that we're having right now I give you so much credit I think I don't know if you've honored that in you but to be so brave to be willing to go to the depth of not even just yourself, but potentially the lineage, the ancestral, you know, trauma, whatever you've carried cellularly. I mean, I, um, I applaud you like from my heart, because as someone who knows that journey, it is the, I have the chills. It is the hardest. I believe it is the hardest work that you could ever do. And, uh, you are so brave to not just do it, but to share and I felt your heart in your Iboga um, podcast speaking so openly to things that are so universal, like, you know, body dysmorphia, insecurity, suicidal uh, ideation, you know, your relationships to men, familial insecurity, whatever it is. And, you know, I think that in terms of this medicine, these plants, whatever substance it is, whatever you feel called to, just trusting that it will give you what you need. It might take 32 times, right? As you've said, and to go back or three years for me, you know, I've probably done 20 plus ceremonies, mostly psilocybin. And, um, and I'll sit with uh, Aya again and whatever else, whatever I feel called to. But I think the bravery that it takes to stand up and say, I'm not okay. And I want to understand why. Um, is so bold and it's so bold as a 31 year old, as a woman, as someone who doesn't come from an Amazonian tribe. That's just like the medicine isn't available. Like you found it, it found you and you went through with it. So kudos to you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I believe this is life work and, uh, and I'm very sensitive to it because I think it's being so, um, degraded and taken advantage of. And, um, in, a, in many ways, just not taken seriously. Like, I don't know what it's like in New Jersey, New York right now, but so much of Austin has become like this, like drug, you know, like spiritually bypass. Let's like mm -hmm. do ketamine and dance. I don't know, you know what? And I don't, I'm not gonna judge that. It just, I think I'm defensive or of the medicine because um, it's healed my heart too. And I can't, I don't think that that sort of strength is something to play with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think when it comes to the psychedelic space and, you know, prominent voices in it and the podcasters in the space and people who have platforms, I think something that's 
unique about me and different about me and I'm starting to speak about this a lot more on the podcast is I actually totally support the intentional safe and informed recreational use of psychedelics Mm -hmm. um it's what brought me to where I am today it's how it's like some of my most cherished and beautiful memories are from like doing MDMA on the dance floor at a festival and I think like to think that humans will ever not want to alter their consciousness for recreational purposes is absurd uh we've been doing it forever we will continue doing it it is a human right if you look at animals in the wild they also like alter their consciousness with opium poppies um when they're dealing with grief like it is a natural human instinct to want to alter your consciousness now whether we're doing it for purposes of healing and spiritual purposes ceremonially or whether we're doing it recreationally to have fun and like people say that like well yeah like fun is healing yes and not everything in our life needs to be healing like we can also just like engage with mdma or ketamine again in a safe and informed way just for the fun of it like when did we stop just having fun as humans like I think the space has become so hyper-focused on healing and like rightfully so because these medicines offer so much for healing but like let's not forget where these came from and like how a lot of people were introduced to them yeah and there's like this like it's like Carl Hart calls it psychedelic exceptionalism when people think who use psychedelics for healing purposes think that they're like so much better than people who use like quote unquote drugs recreationally and it's just crazy it 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 really is just you know I believe that there's space for all of it and intention and education are what we should focus on not like um you know, whether the spiritual healing use is better than the recreational use. So yeah, I just had to interject with that because that's something I really feel strongly about. <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, I honor that so wholeheartedly. And I think I come from it through the lens of like, I had no idea I had subconscious trauma and it led me as like a heal. It's like, help me heal myself, help me save my life. So I entered too in this place of like depression and not knowing what was wrong, whatever. And whenever I've tried to do it in a setting that isn't like blindfold and whenever it's out there, it's too much for me to take. Even if I'm like almost microdosing, cause I think I'm so sensitive and I think it was because of how I was introduced to it. So mm-hmm. my only experiences have been therapeutic because when I've tried otherwise, it hasn't been it hasn't been of service to me. Like I wasn't able to, um, and maybe because I'm highly sensitive and highly attuned, everything was so much that I almost felt like I had to, like had to leave, you know? Yeah. And that, like, what's the first thing we say when engaging with psychedelics set and setting, right? Like it's all <laughs> right. about knowing like the mindset that you're going in with and where you're going to be and who you're going to be with. And then we go into other harm reduction protocols, like testing your substances if they aren't natural, right? Um, Knowing dosage, like (laughs) drug use is not like something to take casually. Like if you want to be someone who does these things either recreationally or ceremonially, like engage with these substances in any way, like you owe it to yourself to get really, really educated and informed. So that's why I say like the education and the intention are just like really at the forefront of all types of drug use and also using your own discernment, right? Like maybe you're someone who just like, it's just not your thing. That's totally okay. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that it can't be other people's thing? No, not at all. I mean, I think, um, it's just such an interesting topic because again, like it's depending on what lens you're looking through and how you use it and and how often you use it and how it uses you and sort of I also believe it's like you know in so many ways we're also this like conduit that the medicine is speaking through us and then you take that with you and you sort of just become this um you're of service to the medicine just as much as it's of service to you like it's it is this it's a relationship 100 percent. it's a relationship and um and just as you said with Aya like how 
you know, you realize through Iboga how much Iowa like potentially confused you and this maybe grounded the plane. You know, I had the same experience because I don't think it was because I wasn't ready for Aya. I, I, but I, because I believe I prepared so deeply to get there, but it was so much. It was so much information. It was like, where do I put all of this information? Kind of. Yes. Thing. I cannot tell you how many people I have seen come out of their first ayahuasca ceremony saying, I have more questions than answers. Mm. Yeah. Super common. Um, super. super I, I, yeah. I, and, and I think that probably makes sense. And then there's a part of me that is almost afraid of it because it's like, if I go into it again, I know that the, how I did, I did it one-on-one. -on -one. I wasn't a group setting and I wasn't out. Like I didn't go away to do it. So the integration was challenging for me. And I think in a way I bypassed it because it was so much. And then it came out as my shadow, like really intensely. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was also just there to teach me. Like That's where you put it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, like yeah. all of this is just such brilliant information that we just yes. continue to just work with and learn from. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me, so if I, uh, you went in to heal your heart mm -hmm. and then that led to the Iboga, tell us about Iboga because it's definitely something as we've discussed, people aren't as familiar with. Oh my gosh. I, I need to take a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> a love note to Iboga. Love Lana. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So with Iboga, I was totally like repulsed by it for the longest time and thought like I would never, I could never, it sounds so intense. I have no desire, like absolutely not totally respected and see it for what it is and how it can really, really help people with, you know, addiction, um, get clean from opiates, but you know, it's just no. Absolutely not. And then I learned about this thing called Iboga for psycho spiritual growth. <laughs> and I actually met a woman in an ayahuasca ceremony. She was sitting right beside me. And she was telling me how, you know, she had done 30 something ayahuasca ceremonies and then did Iboga. And that was the final nail in the coffin. And I was like, wow, cool. But like, oh, I would never. And then something happened in those two ayahuasca ceremonies where it was just like, I think. I think I'm a, I think I might want to try Iboga. And then Sunday morning spoke to her, got like all the information. And I was just like, yes, okay, I want to do this. Which just like speaks to how important it is to share our experiences with others because they can really be the catalyst for other people wanting to have that experience. And sometimes it's not so much even the words that we say, but the resonance that people feel from us when we're sharing, mm -hmm. right? And it actually took me two years from that moment that I decided I wanted to sit with Iboga to actually sit with Iboga. So the process of becoming prepared and ready for this experience was, it was intense mm -hmm. because so Iboga is known as the Mount Everest of psychedelics. And I would say that that's totally accurate because at one point in my journey, I was like, so fucking out of it that I was like I feel like this is the first time I'm doing psychedelics like this is so much and I knew it was going to be like that I knew it was going to be a lot and I just mentally had to prepare for that experience of like being ready for whatever comes up and also being mentally prepared to go places that I've never gone before and I'll stop there and see where you want me to go from there Cause I could, I could go so many different places. <laughs> so given that you reached this place or, you know, realized you were going places that you'd never been before. I think that says a lot coming from someone who's South Aya for 32 times. So like, was it I, like. Iboga is a league of its own. Like it you, totally was is. Was it a fear that came over you or was it just a knowing? It was a fear. It was just like the fear of the unknown that anyone experiences before they try a new medicine or psychedelic, except this was a little more amplified just because I knew how intense and powerful this medicine was. Um, yeah, it, it was definitely like mental preparation. I was really scared. 
And you I mentioned really too, like, you know, you had, you spoke to your family before you were doing this, you know, you, you sort of like laid the groundwork down of like, Hey, I'm jumping into something I've never experienced before. It's not, you know, I am afraid there are, you know, cautionary tales and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. That's really important to mention, like for listeners who don't know about Iboga, it is something that must be taken with like the utmost safety and care because it's not like other psychedelics it's a dissociative as well as a psychedelic so I mean it's like you can't walk on it like you're totally comatose essentially Mm -hmm. a lot of things can go wrong there's many interactions that can take place like this is not something you want to enter lightly and this is not something that you would ever want to do in any quantity on your own so I feel like that's just really important to note um you know you know and just like making sure that the person that you're going to be having this experience with is trained and initiated by the Buiti and is a really boga provider and someone that you can trust because there are a lot of things that can go wrong um okay now that that's out of the way yeah (laughs) talking to my family was like it was just like I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I don't know. I don't know who I'm going to come back as. I don't know how my life is going to change after this. Like, I just need you to know that when I come back from Costa Rica, like my life might look completely different. And Mm -hmm. like, I do think it's going to be for the best, uh, but I just need you to be ready for me potentially coming home and like making lots of changes in my life. Again, like what I'm just getting is just, so much bravery like so much courage I mean like man I am um, personally my psychedelic experiences have been just uprooting a lifetime of trauma 30 years of trauma like getting it out of my body you know we've talked about our, our mutual like for boxing or martial arts or whatever else this physicality you know I never knew why I became a fighter now I know why but like just hearing you jump into this and like these different substances journeys, like, and then having conversations with your family, like pure courage is so grounded and enlightening because it just, the sovereignty that you carry to just be like, this is what I'm doing. It's not up for discussion. This is what I need to do. This is my life. This is my healing takes fucking balls, like not even balls, just like so much chutzpah as (laughs) my Jewish heritage would say. And, um, what's that mean? Just chutzpah is just like, uh, like gall, like lights. Like, interesting, yeah. Uh, hurry. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that about like, it's not up for discussion. This is my life because I think I did have this really significant ayahuasca ceremony. Like, I don't know, it was probably like a year, a year and a half in. And before, <laughs> before I was kind of open about these experiences with the world and those around me I would tell people that I was going to a yoga retreat and I wasn't really honest and then you know one of the main takeaways from this one ayahuasca ceremony was like this realization that like other people's expectations of me and other people's judgments of me and just like what other people think about me is literally none of my business <laughs> it's not my problem it's their problem it's not even about you it has nothing to do with me and my only job is to be honest and authentic about who I am to a degree right like again using discernment right we're not just gonna like go and be like totally free and authentic all of the time like sometimes you know the situation doesn't lend itself to that using discernment but I just felt really uncomfortable about like lying to my family about what I was doing especially when it was just creating such a profound change positive change in my life so my integration from that ceremony was to go home and have a breakfast with my parents and come clean to them about what I was doing. And I remember it was like a summer day and I was like, I need to tell you guys something before you go to work. Like we have to have a conversation. And they were like freaked out. They're like, what is it? What's wrong? Like what's going on? And basically said like, yeah, uh, all those times I said I was going to a yoga retreat. I was actually going to drink this Amazonian tea that's psychedelic and it's been really healing and uh, feel like it's really important to tell you the truth because yeah, it's just really important to me and I don't like lying. <laughs> <laughs> I love 
your perception that it's like bravery or courage, like, thank you so much for saying that. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like brave or courageous to me. It just feels like, well, I'm just being who I am and I can't not be that, if that makes sense. Of course. I mean, listen, I've been through my own journey and have taken on these things and so many other things, you know, and, um, you know, I've been told I'm brave and whatever else. And I, I am met with the same, like, it's just my truth. Like I didn't didn't know any other way. And then I'm telling you from a woman, from someone who sees you that like, it is so brave because you've not only taken on all of this, but you've also chosen to speak to it with, you know, the most renowned experts or whatever else from a scientific lens and now also a personal lens and, you know, from the other end of it. So my experience is like, I've uncovered so much truth and story that I know that I'm here to shed light on authenticity because you would never think that I've had 30 years of trauma or that, you know, any of it. And I get, I've also like, you know, you decided that you didn't ever, you know, people's judgments weren't about you. And I've decided the same thing. The irony is that like, whatever I've been judged for is because there was so much upheaval in me that I didn't, I didn't know anything else, but to be like this fighter, I didn't know anything else, but to be this protected shell. So like, I think it really comes down to just as you are like being who we are from our heart, you know, and, and acknowledging that our egos were here for a reason to protect us. Um, but ultimately like the truth wins and however we're perceived it, again, it's not about us at all. As long as we're living in integrity and in you living your truth and integrity, I see you as someone who, um, is carrying a flag from a place that like you're interviewing Tara, Terrence McKenna, who's like a pioneer and you're standing in your truth, knowing how valuable this medicine is and how valuable you can be to be a mouthpiece for that, for something that's also been around for so long. And, you know, through the lens of you for all of these experts. And so it's a, it's just a beautiful thing because you're spreading knowledge that people need to understand. Like people, um, I think can benefit from not need, but can benefit from. Yeah. That's the beauty of podcast, right? Is like, you can't make anyone listen to it. Like people come to podcasts on their own. And if they're listening to something that you're recording and putting out there, it's because they want to. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the cool thing about it. Yeah. And I think that with, with any sort of content that people are consuming, it's a choice. Right. And, and with that comes a lot of judgment too, but like as long as you stand in truth and and show yourself an integrity, I think there's power in that. And so mm-hmm. I want to jump pivot a little bit to what I took from your Iboga episode. Forget the substance, but obviously not forget it. it's beautiful. Um, it might be a little bit over my listeners' heads if they're just stepping on this path. But you know, just reflecting on what you've shared, um, some of what you shared was like how your unworthiness was manifested through this medicine and um, how you realized how much you spent time doing things for other people. And under the medicine, you found yourself asking like, who am I? So maybe you could speak to the personal side of your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just hearing you reflect those words back to me made me so emotional. Um, It's like, have you ever been in a medicine experience and this thing comes to you and you're like yeah I knew that but now I like know it in my body and my being it's like it has a different resonance to it when you know it under medicine and it was like I had all these you know inklings about how you know I would follow the path of others instead of follow my own path or like take on other people's truth as my own truth And the medicine really showed me that like this deep unworthiness that we all have as human beings, it's perfectly natural. Um, It's just that our, my unworthiness story looks different from your unworthiness story because of what I've been to and through and what my life is and what you've been through and what your life has been like. Mm -hmm. Um, It just really showed me that like, yeah, from a really, really young age, like coming to Canada from Bosnia at the age of four, I felt so just rejected in so many different ways by, you know, classmates and peers and the world. So the way that I kind of solved for that problem was like, 
okay, well, instead of like being who I am, I'll just be like everyone else because everyone else is accepted and cool and worthy. And if I'm just like them, then I will also be accepted and worthy. So the medicine showed like it kind of like I had all these like visions of myself as a very young girl, like being very unhappy and like empty and sad. And I got to like hold myself as a baby and give myself love. And it just like really dawned on me how those early years were so formative to creating that unworthiness hole in my life. And then, yeah, it just came to me that, holy fuck, you have spent your entire life trying to be like other people. Like every single decision that you have ever made was so that you could be like someone else. When do you think that shifted? That I started doing that? No, because I see, I mean, I just am getting to know you through this podcast and through your second, you know, but like I see you as just such a trailblazer. So like, when do you think it was the medicine work that shifted that? Because obviously you're speaking as if you were a young child and like holding you and that is so tender but then like look at how you've grown you know so when did that shift I think it's shifting right now um you know I just brought back the modern psychedelics podcast after like a five six month break and that was a pretty trippy experience because (laughs) I was like wow I hope the listeners aren't rattled because I feel like a completely different (laughs) person than I was the last time that we were on the air and there was definitely some like I hope people still listen and like like it and can relate to me because I just feel like a completely different person um I think after Iboga illuminated it for me so much there's just this like inner anchor that I have with myself that like any decision is run through that inner anchor of like is this what's best for me is this what I want Or am I running this decision based on like outside noise? Mm -hmm. I would say like, that's like my biggest, one of my biggest takeaways from Iboga is like that inner anchor is so strong. And because it's so strong, making decisions is so much easier. Like deciding who to be and how to show up is so much easier. It's just been, yeah, so life-changing. Like I look at myself six months ago and I'm like, yeah, I was definitely like making decisions, trying to be like other people for sure. Yeah. I think that that's so profound and so parallels my experience in like, it sounds, you know, we're ever evolving. I believe anyone tells you that they figured it all out. That's when you stop listening. (laughs) It's like, click, you know? And so in my experience too, it's like, I've chosen to sort of document my healing journey through writing and like working on this book now, but really it was a blog and then some sort of Instagram sharing. So people had been following my journey, but then you get to a point where you're like, well, if now I'm speaking from a lens of like way more healed than I was, as opposed to just like in this cocoon, you know, we're always healing, as I said, like, how does that look? Or what does that mean? And I think I came to this place of just like, whatever is your truth is your truth. So you're going to always attract what, you know, like what you put out there. And if it's through integrity, then it's like, because I had to make peace with that part of me too, of like, you know, I've shared so much and such intimate detail and about relationships and breakup and makeup and breakup and like, um, and that fear of like, does it look crazy? And then it's kind of just like, you know, we all go through this, this cycle of life, you know? And I think when you choose this exponential growth path of healing, given medicine, you know, it's particularly with medicine, it's like buckle up, you know, and then everybody around you buckle up and, um, Cause it's very real. Mm-hmm. Like it's very, very real. Yeah. Yeah. What's, mm, what's coming to me is like, when you say exponential growth path to healing in my head, I was like, is it exponential or is it actually just the way that it's meant to be? Like, have we just been like programmed as a society to think that we just like always have to be healing and like always have to be like our traumas are always going to have to be with us. And like that, like problems just take so long to solve. Or like, are these medicines from the earth here to support us to clear this shit quickly so that we can get back to what matters, which is living life. Like we're not meant to spend our whole 
What's that? No, I'm such a fuck yes for that. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Like, we're not meant our, to spend our whole life in pain. <laughs> we're not. We're not meant to spend our whole life healing. And if you asked me six months ago about the healing journey, I would have told you something completely different. Like, you know, I used to think that like, it's a never ending healing journey. And like, there's just always going to be more to heal. And for the first time in my life, like after Iboga, and I say this very humbly, but I feel fucking healed. Like, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I have to continue digging. See, with ayahuasca, it was like this continuous, like digging and excavating and bringing it all out. And like, how much further can I go? How much further can I go? Right. And after this Iboga experience, I'm like, I actually feel like healed. I went and canceled like all of my ayahuasca retreats for next year. I don't feel the need to sit with ayahuasca anymore after those like three years of monthly sits. Um, like I'm really coming to realize that, you know, again, a message from Iboga was like, problems are meant to be solved quickly and efficiently. We're not meant to live in our problems. Like we're here to live. We're here to enjoy life. We're here to experience life to the fullest. Like the purpose of being alive is to just experience the present moment, which we can't do if we're so wrapped up in our problems. It's, I mean, I agree with you. I think maybe I've ingrained myself this idea of like always healing because I do believe in like, oh, me too. I totally used to believe it too. And I also believe that like, because I'm, you know, I believe in an improvement and like, I, I always want to be a better version of myself, but I agree with you. Like I haven't in my second to last medicine journey, I went into a rebirth into labor for like seven hours. Oh into like, like, I've heard of these. Oh my God. Have you done, have you had this? Have no, you? I've heard of them though. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I will tell you, and I did it at home with my now ex-boyfriend, but he held space for me. And it was, it was like, there's this particular strain of psilocybin. It's super powerful. I took the first dose and very long story that you would love to hear. And then it was very clear after like halfway in, it was like, do you want to see God? And I was like, yes. And the medicine was like, well, you are God. And I was like, well, I know, but I, <laughs> and it was just like, go take more. And I took more and it took me to in labor for seven hours, just wailing, like full out felt everything, you know, and, and just, I had needed to like really release all of this, particularly from my womb, from my vagina, like a lot of this trauma. And it was very clear, like before you bring life into this world, cause I want to have children. Eventually you have to bring yourself back to life. Mm -hmm. And it was just like profound and incredible and everything else. And still after I was like, there's something, whatever I had this wild dream and I was in a sound ceremony and the people in front of me were like talking about the, my writing and it was this beautiful woman. And I said, but um, there's something here. And she said, she grabbed my arm and she goes, you have to let the placenta go. And I was like, what? Hmm. And the placenta is what the, the baby feeds from inside the mother's womb. So it was like, you have to let go of everything that you're seeking to externally. So be it medicine work or the way that you've been eating, the way that you've been moving, you know, boxing, all of this high intensity, you know, the relationships you have, be it uh, intimate or like with family, like everything needs to shift. You need to start only sourcing from yourself. Mm -hmm. And that was the last journey that I did to date. The name of your podcast. I mean, it was exactly. And, you know, of course we teach what we need to learn, but it was yeah. one of these things of like, I've always just thought you'll always be healing. And my point in saying, you know, to relate to you is that like, holy shit, like I think I brought myself, like bring myself back to life. Like yeah. this is like real, this is, you know, the, how you speak to you and how you spoke to on, on your episode about nature and that like just looking around and realizing the power of like the earth. Yeah. I mean, we live in the, like people are so hyper obsessed with abundance and money and all this stuff like you want to see abundance like look outside yeah and look inside it's at how much there. Look, yeah. look inside yeah I mean like uh when you said you said at one point that the medicine said smile more yeah yeah that was one of my big intentions so I'm turning 32 and I feel like I still have this like internal battle of like you're just not pretty. You're just not beautiful. Like this, that, like ladies, 
you know what I'm talking about. I think we all go through this. I don't think I'm alone. Oh, um, you're not. And one of my intentions was to really start seeing myself as more beautiful. Mm. And yeah, I just asked the medicine, how can I be more beautiful? Mm. Instant reply, smile more. I mean, if that's not beautiful, that is just like, uh, and I think that that's, I think that beauty is, is, is an energetic reflection of our soul. It's just like light, just light, you know, and yeah. And I think if you've experienced any sort of hardship in life, like everybody on this universe, you know, it's so, it's sometimes so much easier to project that darkness or that lack as opposed to just smiling or being that light. And, and I also want to acknowledge your comment about like healing your relationships to men, because I think whether you connect it or not, you know, how we perceive ourselves or beauty or whatever else. So often it's like, well, will they think I'm pretty or how do, how, who are, how are we seen in relation to men or attraction? And um, can you just quickly explain how the medicine helped you in that healing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have just felt like I don't have this great relationship with men and like trusting men and have like, not, I'm not going to go into much detail publicly, but my relationship with like, I have an older brother and my dad, they've just been pretty. My computer froze. Sorry. Oh, there. Okay. Keep going. Okay, cool. Yeah. My, my relationship with my dad and my brother has just like not been what I want it to be. And I knew there was some work to be done there. And like, I got little pieces of it during ayahuasca, but I just like, it never took me to the finish line. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my intentions for Iboga were like things that I tried to work on with the ayahuasca, but it just like didn't take me there. Um, and just being a part of this retreat at Iboga Wellness, you know, the facilitator is a man and I've never actually had a man hold space for me before. Mm -hmm. And um, there was also two male helpers. So there's a lot of men like holding me that weekend. And that, that in itself, like outside of the medicine was so like, I just really needed that. Mm. I didn't know how much I needed that. I just needed to see that like, I can be held like that by men. Mm. And then, Ugh. yeah, I think, I think that was really the, the healing that took place there. And, you know, there was some stuff that came up around, my brother that I don't want to share, but I think it's really about like, yeah, the relationship with the masculine. And a lot of people say that Iboga is a masculine energy and it kind of is, but it's also very feminine. Um, it's both. Um, and the way that it's like so direct and clear is like a very masculine energy, right? Whereas like ayahuasca is like so floaty and ethereal and like all of the possibilities. Um, but I think my relationship with like that directness and that voice of truth has changed. Mm. So yeah, like I'm only a month out of this, so I'm still integrating it, but I think there's something there around like, yeah, that relationship with like the masculine energy of directness is really nothing to be afraid of it's actually a very useful energy to have in life and like even like one of the insights I got which I think I said like problems are to be solved quickly and efficiently like that's a very like masculine like take charge and like yeah just like solve the problem you don't have to like fester on it um yeah so I think it's about the the energy of it and becoming more comfortable with it and integrating it into my life along with the feminine mm -hmm. The, that balance, I think, especially if you're a doer, you know, it's that forever, you know, that seeking both that intimacy of both sides of self, which I, I think I lean into more and more as I've done more of this work, because it's been such a defense mechanism of mine to just be in that ego and be in that masculine. And, and then, as you said, too, like one of, I think it was my second or third ceremony, it was a couple that held me a husband and wife and before the ceremony, I was so triggered by him being there because I had pulled up a, a trauma, just one trauma before. And I was so afraid that I wouldn't be able to feel safe and that it would ruin it for me. And he was actually the most poignant part of my whole ceremony. And sadly, 
he passed away from a brain aneurysm probably a year ago, but he is with me. Like I, he is with me in every ceremony I have to date. Like I feel his, I know he's holding me. And um, if I hadn't allowed for that, you know, I don't know how I would receive the masculine and, you know, that soft masculine. And to the extent that like my, my just previous relationship, I called in a partner who was the first man who really was able to hold me, who um, not able, who, who I potentially allowed to hold me in that, you know, space of love. And so it's really that, I think that ever evolving dance within ourselves of like the fight and the flow, you know, which is so, um, aligned with the business I started because it was really about channeling the yin and yang in this physicality so that we could open up to it, you know, and it's the same as for men to be in their feminine, in their yin, in their softness, in their heart. And, um, you know, gender aside, I think we're all seeking that balance constantly of, you know, doing, being heart, ego, you know. Oh yeah. And, you know, like, talking about plant medicine, like the ultimate yin and yang is ayahuasca and viboka. Mm. Like they're yeah, I'm really, really intrigued, Lana. I'm really yeah, they're really the perfect contrast that we need both of and they come together so beautifully. And yeah, I mean the giving and the taking energy too, right? Like giving and receiving is like when you give, you actually are receiving because you're so happy to give and when someone receives they're giving as well to you like it's all just yeah this beautiful energetic flow and exchange so with all of that said thank you so much for your time and your gifts and your sharing um my last question is the phrase everything we need is inside what does that speak to to you mm, truth truth that's truth I deeply believe that. Yeah. And I'll tie it to what I learned from Iboga, which was that all of the answers are within nature, but also we are nature and everything that is true in nature is also true within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much um, for sharing, for showing up, for being a light in this world and for um, shedding light on this beautiful work. Uh, where can people find you? Thank you. Yeah. So the podcast is called Modern Psychedelics. You can listen to it anywhere you listen to, you know, podcasts. Um, and then our Instagram is, or my Instagram is Modern Psychedelics. And then I'm also a professional coach. I work with a lot of people who are on the psychedelic path. And um, basically, it's a lot of both integration and just like living a mm -hmm. psychedelic life. Yeah, that's what that's what um, that's what I'm all about. So Love yeah, it. if any of you out there want to come say hi, please do. I'm pretty good at um, responding to DMs. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Um, and I'm excited to learn more and keep listening. Thank you so much, Olivia. It's been fun. You too. Thank you. It's a wrap.